Welcome to the Social Learning Amplified podcast, the podcast that brings us candid conversations with educators who are finding new ways to engage and motivate their students inside and outside the classroom. Each episode of Social Learning Amplified will give you real life examples and practical strategies you can put into practice in your own courses. Let's meet today's guest. Welcome to Social Learning Amplified. I am your host, Eric Mazur, and our guest on the episode today is Julie Schell of the University of Texas at Austin, where she is Assistant Vice Provost of Academic Technology. She holds a number of other titles, including Executive Director, Instructional Continuity, Innovation and Accreditation, College of Fine Arts, and Assistant Professor of Practice, Program in Higher Education Leadership. Julie, welcome to Social Learning Amplified. Hey, Eric, it's great to see you. It's good to see you. So, Julie, as you know, it's a special year. We have celebrated 30 years of peer instruction. I, I just can't believe how how time flies. You know, it was 30 years ago that I decided to throw my entire class upside down and uh, start teaching by questioning rather than uh, telling. Yeah. Now. You've told me this story a while back, and 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 I know that it's sort of the origin how you and I connected way back when. But how did you first learn about peer instruction? Well, I just have to say I'm so I'm just so grateful that you you took your teaching seriously and thought about how you might improve your teaching because the moment that you decided that led to a transformation in my life. And that is my origin story with peer instruction, and I'm I'm so excited to to share it with you. Um, I was getting my doctorate in higher and post secondary education at Teachers College at Columbia University, and I was pursuing uh, the research question: Why do research active tenured faculty members uh, try to improve their introductory undergraduate teaching? So that was a, a big question that I had. I was trying to understand why someone would do that, right? Because as you know, there's not a lot of incentives for improving your teaching at Research One universities. Uh, the incentives are really geared towards towards research, right? So, so I'm, I was very curious. Why would someone try to improve their their teaching? And so I set up my study at two major research universities uh, here in the U.S. And I began interviewing tenured faculty who were research active, but who were also teaching introductory undergraduate science courses. And I kept uh, I kept hearing this um, I kept hearing this response of um, Oh well, I I heard Eric Mazur give a talk about peer instruction, and it changed it completely changed my teaching, and it reinvigorated me, and uh, it it. It, it not only inspired me to improve my teaching, but it inspired me to change uh, what I was doing and really um, use peer instruction to, to radically improve uh, student learning in my, in my courses. And I just think, who is this guy? He, who, who is this person that everybody keeps talking about? And it was chemistry faculty, physics faculty, astronomy faculty, math faculty, um, you know, I was, uh, engineering faculty. I was looking at a broad, uh, you know, broad number of folks and they just kept saying Eric Mazur I'm like who is this guy so that that's how I that's how I first heard about it um the story goes on from there I assume that there are a number of listeners who have not really heard about peer instruction would you be able to define it in your own words Julie completely it actually picks up from this previous story so as I was uh, studying and pursuing my my question about why are people doing this I went to a chemistry class at a major research university on the East Coast. It was one of these auditorium style classrooms with tiered seating. There were uh, 500 plus students in the classroom and I was sitting there. I wasn't quite sure what I was in for, but this person had mentioned you and that he used peer instruction in class. And so as I was sitting there, uh, the instructor was uh, had, a, had a question up on the screen and he was he was lecturing. And then all of a sudden, um, the room erupted into conversation. 
and I saw the students and they were, they were, they were like playing with uh, what I thought were mobile phones. And, and so I was looking around, I was like, so I, I literally wrote in my observation notes, students not paying attention, playing with phones. Um, and then I started listening to the conversations and they were, uh, they were talking about the content. So wait a se second, something's happening here. Uh, the instructor was up on the stage. The students were completely engaged. They were moving their hands. It was something funny is happening. I started to listen to the content conversations that they were having, and they were convinced, trying to convince one another uh, of an answer. I, I, I said, wait a second, something magic is happening. And that is the moment that I changed, and I became a complete evangelist of peer instruction. And so for me, what peer instruction is, is a, it's a, a social learning pedagogy where uh, an instructor will um, present uh, a, a, a concept and pose a question. And over time, those, uh, at first those questions are, I think we talked about them being uh, conceptual questions, but over time that's really broadened. It really could be any kind of question. And then have the students think of an answer on their own first. And that's what they were doing. They were using, they were using clickers um, at, at that time because this was in, in the early 2000s. Um, commit to an answer, uh, think about it, and commit to an answer, and then turn to their neighbor and discuss that answer and try to um, convince them that, that their rationale is right um, uh, and use evidence from their, their learning to do that. And then uh, when it's time, when the instructor sort of hears and feels in the room that the, that, that amazing conversation is sort of dimmed down a little bit to uh, recommit to, an, uh, to their answer again, so vote again. And then um, finally, the instructor reveals um, either the correct answer or an explanation if it is a question without a correct answer and then leads to a discussion. So um, the, the short definition is it's a social learning pedagogy that is jam packed with learning benefits. The long answer is this uh, explanation of, of the, what, you, what you might expect to see if you run a short peer instruction engagement in your class. Now, you, you've studied peer instruction, I think, for, for well over a, a decade, including sort of what the, the cognitive basis is for, for its success. Um, what makes this method work? So this method, I like to, I like to um, describe it as a potent cocktail of learning science. So it is absolutely jam-packed with a whole host of benefits uh, to learning. And uh, we can talk about a few of the top ones. One of them is that, um, as you describe in the peer instruction manual, um, the questions are the questions that an instructor would pose are generally always associated with learning outcomes. So what you would want students to know and be able to do um, to, to after taking a particular course. Um, when the questions for peer instruction are aligned with those higher level learning outcomes, it creates um, a really uh, a, a structured and um, goal-oriented um, experience for students. So it's very aligned um, with what we know about learning, that when there's a learning outcome that's staged um, and then that is backed up by the activities in the class, um, that that's what propels learning forward. So that's kind of the high level. But when you start to get inside the that's the, when you start to get inside that cocktail, um, there first of all, it's it's just there's a there's a concept called retrieval practice or retrieval enhanced learning, and peer instruction has all of the benefits of retrieval. So, so I'm going to give a concrete example here of a question. Let's imagine that. Uh, we're, we're in class and I'm standing in front of the room and I've got a glass full of water and it's got also ice cubes floating in it. Okay, so I've got a glass of water with ice cubes floating in it. I want to ask the students, okay, uh, here's this glass. When these ice cubes melt, melt by the end of class, is the water going to spill over the top of the glass? Okay, so that's an example of a question I might ask. And I ask students to, to select an answer. Uh, to think about it and use what their learning is in this class um, to, to respond to that answer. And so that first question 
the students have to engage in pulling information from their memory. So that's the first uh, benefit um, that is uh, that is established in a hundred years plus of learning science that the act of pulling information from memory strengthens the memory. In fact, Aristotle said that. So this is a really, really um, established uh, theory from from cognitive science. Um, so that first act of pulling information from memory, it writes on the memory. Um, and that also involves metacognition, right? So metacognition is thinking about your thinking and developing awareness of your learning state. So when we first think about, okay, is the is, are the ice cubes, when they melt, is the water going to flow over? What happens? What is my, my knowledge here on this particular concept? I'm going to develop awareness as to whether I know the answer or not, or whether I'm confident in, in my answer or not. And I'm going to then make a decision about that. And so that metacognition, that development of that awareness um, is sort of the, it's, it's the holy grail of learning. Uh, being able to recognize what you know and what you don't know so that you can self-regulate your learning afterwards. Um, so those are the first sort of two, um, the two learning science benefits. Now you might be asking, but what if they select the wrong answer, right? Um, so if the retrieval is so powerful, what happens if I say, yes, the water's going to flow over, right? Because that's not the right answer, is it? <laughs> The water no, it's is, not. No, so, I know my so physics. What happens I know next? my physics. Um, Very so, good. What happens next? So, so then, um, the so then the, this is where the the magic comes in. Um, when the student um, turns to their neighbor, and we usually cue them to try to find someone who has a different answer, um, so that there is some cognitive dissonance there, um, some some motivation to to come to uh, a resolution together. Um, when the students are talking to one another, they're, they're actually engaging in a different type of retrieval. They're retrieving what we would call, um, you know, more, um, uh, not soft skills, but a different type of skill that is important in this case to science, um, which is argumentation and backing up your, um, your knowledge with evidence. So as you start to think about, okay, well, how do I convince this person? How, what evidence do I draw on? They're starting to pull out, and, and um, uh, it's called retrieval enhanced facilitation. They're pulling on other, um, they're pulling on other content knowledge that they know both from physics, but also conversational skill, social skill, argumentation skills, um, and that would we, we would call that variable retrieval. So the first act is just pulling information from memory, but then when they're in discussion they're actually retrieving a bunch of different types of skills as well as the content knowledge. As they're engaged in that conversation, so many um, amazing things happen. Um, first, they're, you know, they're, they're getting to have active engagement with their peer. It's definitely active learning. They're thinking deeply and, and, and um, considering the content knowledge at a really deep level. And they're starting to they're they're starting to again gain even further metacognitive awareness about their responses. Um, the next step is then again another going back to that other type of retrieval, which is just the the retrieval of the content knowledge. But now they've constructed a different uh, they they've their knowledge has actually changed. Their brains have changed as part of that uh, that conversation with their peers. They've developed new new understandings, or they firmed in on their answer. So one student might say, no, it definitely flows over. And the other student says, no, because this, this, this theory, this, you know, I'll, I'll let you dig in on that. Um, I do know, I do know the principle, but um, we don't need to go into that, that detail. If once they commit, you ask them again, okay, now that you've had that conversation, we're going to commit to a, a, our final answer. Students either change their answers or they um, they stick with their answer. And then the instructor does the reveal. And that's the really important part. Um, you have, if there is a correct answer, you always want to make sure you give a reveal. So some I've learned over the past decade, some people will want to uh, think that it incentivizes or motivates students to go and um, uh, and think about the question afterwards, and then they'll come back in class and you'll give them the correct answer. Retrieval is so powerful. Um, it's so, so deeply powerful to the memory 
that if you don't give them the correct answer at that point, they will remember the wrong answer. So that's why it's really important. And if you're asking questions that don't have a right answer, then you want to try to give explanatory feedback. Um, and it just kind of capping this off here, what the science of retrieval says is that you want to, uh, like the, the, the cocktail is that it involves multiple types of retrieval. As I said, the information retrieval is where, as the retrieval that's happening during the peer instruction, it involves metacognition, um, it involves learning from your peers and constructing content knowledge in that way. It, and it involves spaced retrieval because you've done the re retrieval at the beginning of the question and the middle of the question at the end of the question. And it involves feedback, both correct answer and explanatory feedback. This is a, it, this is a, a, based on some of the most established science in learning. It's peer instruction is one of the, if not the most potent cocktail of learning science that I've that I've ever encountered. I, I know that the thing that always has struck me the most whenever I teach using peer instruction is seeing students have this aha moment, talk to each other. Right? I say no, it won't flow over, or or I say yes, it will flow over. You say no, it won't flow over, and then we talk, and then you say something that makes me go. Oh, right. This aha moment, the, the and the, the 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 incredible number of aha moments you see around you. Um, how would you describe that aha moment, and why is that aha moment not happening when I simply teach through lecturing? So that's a great question. So you know, certainly that those aha moments are definitely something that you'll observe and that I've observed often when I'm engaging with peer instruction. And I think that it is, it does involve that opportunity for metacognition, right? You are inviting through peer instruction, you're giving an invitation for a student to think about their learning state. What do I know? How do I know it? What do I need to do to improve my knowledge? Um, that invitation doesn't happen during a straight lecture right? There's a, there's no pause. And with a straight lecture, it's passive. It's passive instruction. With peer instruction, that invitation invites active learning. A lot of people think that active learning means standing up and moving. That's not what it means. Active learning, you know, it's variably defined in the literature, but what really what active learning is, is cognition. Um, it's thinking about the depth and duration of, of thinking about the content. So when a student is just sitting and listening to a lecture, there's no invitation. Uh, there's no invitation for that for that metacognition. In addition, students um, are near peers, right? You're not a near peer to a student. You are a master. Uh, you're you're you have deep, deep, deep mastery um, with the subject matter knowledge, and we we can call this. It goes by various names in the literature. The curse of knowledge. When you, as a master, um, as a as a as a as a as a world-renowned physicist, your brain um, it it gets rid of all the information that it doesn't need. It gets rid of all those little pieces of knowledge that it doesn't need, and 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 pushes it out. And just has these very high-level conceptual frameworks. Students are not at that level, so they still have those little pieces of knowledge. Um, in, in, in their conceptual frameworks um, as they've recently learned the material. So it's easier for them to say, oh, hey, it's this or this or this. They can remember what it feels like not to know. You have the curse of knowledge. You can't remember what it feels like not to know these things. Um, so it's easier for a near peer, so someone who just knows a little bit more than the person next to them or has a little bit more evidence to create that aha moment for them. So I would say it's those two things. Yeah, I think Susan Ambrose uh, in her book, uh, How Learning Works, calls it the expert blind spot, right? Yes. We, 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 don't, we don't have in our brains as experts anymore what the, what the students have, and therefore it's hard to see it from their, um, from their point of view. The other amazing thing about peer instruction is that when you're listening to students, you're starting to develop an understanding of their learning state. There are so many times when I'm listening to peer instruction uh, conversations between students and I think, oh, I never thought of that. 
Uh, so in during the peer instruction, I'm actually learning. I'm not teaching. I'm listening and I'm developing an understanding of what my lear- students' learning states are and what are the different misconceptions and correct conceptions that they have. That helps my move my teaching forward as well. Okay, I have two short questions to uh, wrap up our podcast here. Um, one of these peer instruction cycles, question, think, commit, debate, recommit, explain, one of these cycles takes, takes anywhere between five and 10 minutes. So over the years, I think many people have been thinking about how to simplify, speed that up. Um, what should people be aware of if they modify the method? What are sort of the, the key parts in, in, in just a few words, because we're quickly running out of time? Sure. Um, so I think that for you, one of the beauty of peer instruction is that it's entirely flexible and you can modify it in whatever way that you choose. But when you do that, you should think about the, the impacts to learning that the modifications might make. So if you remove that, a lot of people will just move that first retrieval. They'll just have the students uh, uh, pair and share, um, and they won't they won't do the the, the first uh, um, question commit. commit, commit. Um, and so if you skip that, then you're skipping the retrieval. So that's uh, that's a you know you just need to know that um, if it's something that you really want the students to remember, uh, you might think about not skipping that. Certainly, you wouldn't want to skip the peer instruction because that's uh, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of the method. So you would never want to skip that. Again, if you skip the if you skip the correct answer feedback, if there is a correct answer or the explanatory feedback, you you um, you're running the risk of having a negative impact or inhibiting learning. And so I, I think that the commit, discuss, uh, commit. Those are the magic pieces of peer instruction, um, so you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily want to skip that. On the other hand, um, where you have complete and total flexibility is in the question type. Uh, you, you can ask yes or no questions. You can ask open ended questions. You can ask questions without a right answer. You can ask conceptual questions. Um, I think that's where a lot of the freedom comes in. Thank you. And then one final question: Where should we? be thinking about going next with peer instruction? I think with peer instruction, where we need to go next is really thinking about how to do it effectively in some of these new modalities that we're, we're experiencing right now. So in hybrid instruction and in online instruction, in asynchronous instruction, um, how can we creatively use videos during the perusal exchange? One uh, person asked me if we could do um, asynchronous peer instruction using perusal. So that's something that I've been really thinking about and thinking about how to, to use perusal to do asynchronous PI and, and, and imagining what that might look like and how to, how to implement that. So I, I think it's using peer instruction in these new modalities because at its base, it is fundamentally one of the easiest and best things you can do for student learning. We need to be able to adapt it to these new modalities uh, of where we're at now 30 years later. That's wonderful. I, I can't wait to, for, to see what the next 30 years will bring. So thank, thank you. you so much, uh, Julie, for kicking off this po- podcast series with me. And thank you all for listening, of course. This uh, podcast will be made available on streaming platforms. And please subscribe to learn more about social learning. Thank you so much, everyone. Turn to your neighbor. Social Learning Amplified is sponsored by Perusal, the social learning platform that motivates students by increasing engagement, driving collaboration, and building community through your favorite course content. To learn more, join us at one of our introductory webinars. Visit perusal.com to learn more and register.